on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Welcome to Corner of the Galaxy, the show that talks 100% L.A. Galaxy soccer. We're glad you could join us. Now it's time to sit back and relax as your hosts navigate through the twisting, turning, but never boring world of the five-time MLS Cup champion, L.A. Galaxy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Corner of the Galaxy on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Kessman, coming to you on a Thursday May 4th. May the 4th be with you and also with you. Uh, hope everybody's having a great day. Great Thursday. LA Galaxy getting ready to take on Colorado. We're going to talk about that game. Uh, Douglas Costa heard again. Uh, the Deadpool movie tickets that are being sold at Dignity Health Sports Park are too expensive. We'll talk about all that. Uh, Colorado and Kevin Cabral are back. And of course, uh, the LA Galaxy and analytics. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of little things, including supporters groups holding their own meeting. So we want to get to all that. Now, before we get to all that, I want to introduce you to my co-host. He's back. We're glad to have him. It's Eric, the Portuguese. Oh, I'm sorry. He's, he's okay. So here's the deal. Let me tell you about um, Eric. Uh, he texted me about noon today and was like, hey, I'm not feeling good. And he goes, so, you know, the whole deal. And then he goes, hey, I went to urgent care. I have the flu. I think I'm going to play it by ear. But, you know, just in case, just so you know, I, I may not be here. And so about an hour before the show, he goes, hey, uh, I'm out. That was it. And and if you have the flu, I think the last thing you wanted to be doing is talking about the LA Galaxy. In fact, most people, uh, whenever they talk about the LA Galaxy right now, already have a strong, like, you know, uh, acid reflux, uh, you know, reaction to to all the stuff. So um, I did. Absolutely. I know that was harsh, too. Right. Wait here. Here, I'll bring it down this time. I'll bring it down this time. Okay. Um, uh, I, I did want to just sort of update everybody on, on, uh, all the stuff that is, is going on. I did try to reach out to Sophie and see if she was available short notice. She wasn't, uh, I did reach out to Mr. Christian miles. He's actually in Miami and he was like, oh, he goes, I want to do it so bad, but I can't. Um, he's there, uh, covering some, uh, Sudamericano. Um, so he's doing some, some play by play there. So, uh, I know Right now, half of you have already turned it off because I can see the numbers dropping. You're like, no hammer, no party. I get it. Uh, whole deal. So I'm going to do my best. Uh, I try not to have solo shows as much as we have been, but for circumstances, the way they've been and sort of trying to balance everything with Kevin and everybody's schedules and everything like that, show must go on, so I will be here to uh, to help you. Um, there is no truth, by the way, that uh, the hammer is out partying with Douglas Costa, whatever weekend event he's now uh, going to do. Uh, I think that there's there's no truth to that. I just wanted to 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 break that rumor. So I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody had a good weekend. Um, I hope everybody had a good week. Uh, and now we're getting ready for the LA Galaxy and the Colorado Rapids coming up. Let's get you uh, just some information on that game. So that way you are once again prepared. Uh, LA Galaxy and Colorado Rapids coming up. Digging in Hill Sports Park on Saturday, May 6th. Game 7.30 p.m. TV time, 7.39 p.m. kickoff time. Game can be found on MLS Season Pass. Uh, this one is behind the paywall. Don't complain. I, I really don't. I, I could get out the whiny fan. Oh, but you have to make me pay for the games and I have to stream stuff. I don't care. Uh, really don't care, uh, because there's plenty of free games that you can watch if you're interested in that. And then there's people who don't even want to watch the free games and think that's too hard. So really there's no pleasing everybody. So if you have MLS season pass, you're able to watch it. And if you don't, you can't pretty some pretty similar to a lot of the blackout rules that we're having on there on as well. Um, I like class trends. Have me on. I play pro clubs with hammer. Yeah. I mean, hammer's awesome. Um, hammer plays pro clubs. I don't know how hammer actually has time to do all the stuff that he does. 
um, because the dude works hard, really hard as well. So this is a this is an Eric Vieira appreciation post while he's hugging hugging and praying to the porcelain god. Uh, we appreciate you, Eric, even all the way out in Texas. All right. Um, so let's get to uh, some LA Galaxy stuff, some stuff to talk about. Uh, I joked around a little bit, and we certainly talked about this on Monday night with Kevin, but we talked about Wrexham uh, coming to play LA Galaxy 2. Now, there was a pre-sale that was going on for these tickets, right? And so we were able to peer, peer into the pre-sale to see what a ticket between a third division American club, which is MLS Next Pro, uh, and I think fourth well, soon to be fourth, but currently fifth tier English side, Wrexham, uh, who is the National League champions, but they're coming up. So uh, I believe that puts them in, in uh, who's, who's going to say, is it is it um, League Two? I believe it's League Two, right? League Two, League One. No, that would be third. No, that's fourth tier. Yeah. So um, they're, they're into the league system again um, and, and out of the National League. Um, so they're coming. And so I, I don't know what I expected from this. Um I didn't expect that tickets would range from what I was able to see. So if you were able to go into the standing section, so it wasn't the supporter sections, but just outside of those in the standing sections, you could find tickets for about $55 in the standing section. Now, I heard that um, season ticket members, I, I think you could get, get them for as low as $40, maybe even lower in some of the supporter sections, that type of thing. So, you know, you could expect that that's there. So $55, not bad, but, you know, it's a USL game. Uh, actually, it's below USL whenever you do it. Um but then I went and looked, and if you go to almost any of the other seats, and this is non-season ticket member pricing, uh, it's like $110 to $250 a ticket. I think uh, season ticket members were getting somewhere in there from like $70, $80 bucks in that range, probably $50, $60, $70, $80, $80, somewhere in that range for this. This is an MLS Next Pro side that is, that is remarkably young. Okay, for the LA Galaxy, they are starting very young players, very young team. This is all developmental. This is about guys who are learning how to be professional athletes for really almost the first times in their lives coming out of LA Galaxy Academy and some other places. They're, they're learning how to be professional athletes and you're going to charge $55 for a standing for for a standing for a standing ticket. You're going to charge $55, $110, $500 for sideline seats. I get it in some sense, but this game, in my opinion, is certainly not for LA Galaxy fans. Um, you may fi find it fun. It's a total novelty, right? A total novelty whenever you look at this. I actually think it's a cool little thing to do, but this is more for Wrexham fans than this is for LA Galaxy fans because it's not even the senior team. And by the way, there's nothing but to lose if you play the senior team, right? Like you can't, you can't win anything. If you're the LA galaxy as the senior team, you can only lose, but now you're going to put up these young kids who I think this will be a good test for, but these young kids learning how to be professionals against guys who really are in some ways traveled seasoned veterans who have warred their way through the lower levels of the English tiered system. Um, you know, I have to imagine that the experience side of things puts Wrexham in the driver's seat for this. I, am I curious about the level of play between the two? Absolutely. Am I $110 curious? Am I $250 curious? I don't think I'm either of those things. And I, I'm, I imagine that I will, I will be able to get in for free for a press pass. And that seems about right for me. Um, but having said that, the the pricing to this, at least to me, screams these seats aren't for you, Galaxy fans. Um, you know this the the pricing screams this is a cash grab, but it's a cash grab by both clubs, right? Let's be very clear. When the LA Galaxy went on tour after the season to go to different places, Australia, uh, I think they went to did they go to Indonesia the one time? Um, you know they did these postseason tours where they went and played games. Those were cash grabs, right? With David Beckham and Robbie Keane and all those. Those are cash grabs. Do it. We understand what a cash grab is. It's a, it puts a club in a better position. I would imagine that uh, Ryan Reynolds and Rob McInerney. Um, I imagine that they're sitting there saying we can make a lot of money touring in the United States, and that can help offset some of the amount of money that we had to sink into this club. Now, I am not a, a Wrexham hater like so many people. I think, oh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to football. No, I, I disagree 100%. It seems that, yes, they've made a documentary about it. That was always their plan. Uh, yes, they, they were able to um, turn something that was uh, possibly undervalued into something that is now very much valued 
with Wrexham. And by moving up the leagues, that incre- that increases their value of the club, right? These are all, listen, owners buy soccer teams for all sorts of reasons. They like to compete, but there also is a general understanding that there's going to be an appreciation model on all this. And then it's going to be worth more than what you bought it for. And that's wealth, right? The LA Galaxy are in that with a team that's worth almost a billion dollars. Right. Philden, uh, Uncle Phil didn't pay a billion dollars for the L.A. Galaxy whenever he started it. Right. So um, these are the things that I look at whenever we say, you know, we understand what's inherently true by all accounts that I can find. Wrexham fans are perfectly fine with Deadpool and 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 Rob and always sunny in Philadelphia coming in there and being the owners of this because they've done it, quote unquote, the right way. Now, whether the documentary certainly cover, colors that in rose colored glasses, I imagine it does. Um, but I don't think see them out there trying to sell out this team or do anything like that whenever it comes to it. Um, so it's not the worst thing that ever happened. And I fully expect that they're going to take advantage of Hollywood and do all the things. But at $250 a ticket in the um, premium sections, which is still just a seat in a stadium, you know, on the other side of the stadium where the press box isn't, it's the same seat, but it's, you know, $125 cheaper. I always find that that's humorous. Um, but whenever you look at these things and how they're sort of put together, right, this is this is this is fine for Wrexham. This is what Wrexham probably should be doing with their newfound fame uh, with their sponsorships that they have. And they put it in there. The LA galaxy just provided them that, that location uh, in Hollywood, quote unquote Hollywood to do this. Um, and so you do that in that stadium and the whole deal. And it's just, it's just money. I'm interested to see how many people go to this game. Um, I would bet it's a lot more than you think it's going to be because Wrexham has a very large following in the United States. So we'll see how many of those people in the United States are there. And then we get to compare levels of play, which is always fun and always interesting, right? What does it mean? Nothing, but it will be fun and we'll get to talk about it on the podcast and that's something to do as well. So, okay, there we go. Uh, that's what I wanted to, uh, to, to sort of say. Yeah. And people are like, I spent, I did see these comments. They're like, I spent less to go see Real Madrid whenever I was in Madrid. Right. And it's, and I totally get that. Yeah. To me, the pricing is so far outside of demand. It's crazy. We'll also see whether or not there is demand, right. And whether or not they will sell out this thing and how many people show up and all those things, because if that happens, um, then we can all say, Hey, we were wrong. And the LA galaxy get a piece of this, right? So, um, overall it, it's probably nothing. It's a cash grab and we can talk about it for 20 minutes. We can talk about it for three minutes. Um, both sides are using this as a cash grab and the galaxy are certainly using their position positioning inside of Southern California and inside of Los Angeles to be able to say, this is Hollywood where it comes. I imagine, and I said this and people wanted to disagree with me. I imagine it's going to be quite the star studded event. Uh, Ryan Reynolds doesn't really do anything where it's not star studded. Um, so I, I would imagine that he will be all over that place. And I imagine his celebrity friends will be there as well. Um, the most star studded game I can ever remember at, uh, at Dingley Hell Sports Park was whenever AC Milan came in and Tom Cruise was there. Um, and they had like the suite set up on the, the berm too. They were like, I think they claimed there were 30 something thousand people in that stadium or something like that. Um, but yeah, it's super interesting with all that. Um, so again, it's LA Galaxy 2. It's MLS Next Pro. Um, and it's definitely not a, um, not something where you can sit there and say, oh, okay, you know, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. Um, he's super asked why isn't galaxy Two an open cup because they have rules against that for, for double ownership of teams. Um, so they can't compete against each other. They, they basically outlawed the, the two teams there for a while. So, uh, that was something I wanted to get to, but speaking of ticket prices, I also wanted to talk about this. Obviously it's on everybody's mind. Uh, the LA galaxy launching two deals. Uh, they're doing some, some mini plans. They have a summer of soccer plan starting at $72. Uh, it's uh, Saturday, May 27th against Charlotte Saturday, July 8th against the Philadelphia union and Saturday, August 26th against Chicago fire. You can go up those three games for starting at $72. And then they also now launched another mini plan, uh, the stretch run mini plan. Uh, this is when they think the LA galaxy will be stretching for the, uh, the playoffs. Maybe I agree. Maybe not. Starting at $72, uh, September 10th against St. Louis City. Um, and then it's September 30th, Portland Timbers, and October 21st to FC Dallas. So those are the stretch plans as well. So plans out there, things going on. Uh, lots of people, uh, uh, I'm sure, clamoring to find uh, out what this one-win LA Galaxy team can do uh, down the quote-unquote stretch. Um, yeah, it's a... Uh, it's a lot. And listen, mini plans have been in play. I know there's going to be people like, oh, look, see, they're, they're really, they've been, mini plans have been around forever. Um, the Galaxy have routinely done mini plans. I think the first time I ever went to uh, a Galaxy game was part of like a little mini plan type of thing. 
So I went once with the with the soccer team, which everybody knows my my adult soccer league team. Um, and then I think I went back as part of some mini plans Then eventually got season tickets. And that's how that whole thing went. Um, so anyway, so here is your your stretch plans and all those fun things. Um, I wanted to get to some supporter stuff as well. Uh, and both L.A. Riot Squad, um, I think uh, Galaxy Outlaws, Ghost Ultra Galaxy and of course Galaxians. Um, have asked me to share some stuff on the boycott and the boycott update. Remember, ACB will be back in the stadium for the May 6th game, Star Wars night. We, uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see uh, what happens inside the stadium with that and how that protest carries over in there. And they have put out some posts saying that, uh, you know, the boycott is just beginning and that they're going to... Uh, they're, the the protests are just beginning and they're going to be inside. They're going to be protesting. They're not going to be buying concessions, um, you know, not buying merchandise, those types of things and, and staying. So it's interesting to see how that affects the in-stadium atmosphere of things. Um, and then you have the, uh, the boycott update from Lars and the rest of the supporters groups on the outside of the stadium. Uh, basically, they, ask, they asked to share this. Uh, the boycott is still on for Lars and others still participating uh, in an effort to shift focus to unity for all Galaxy fans. Lars, Galaxy Outlaws, Ghost Ultra ultras galaxy and galaxians will hold an online open forum on friday may 12th um so that's next friday um online forum uh on friday may 12th for all galaxy fans to ask questions speak their minds and have their say this boycott was never meant to exclude non-supporters we hope to correct that we want to hear uh hear out the entire fan base as we try to move forward and include everyone for the betterment of the galaxy community we ask that all g's be respectful and not use the opportunity to make personal attacks on others keep an eye on our socials for more details to come so uh the the other side of the boycott staying outside the stadium trying to bring some people together outlaws have the same um same information uh on theirs as well so coming about this and really trying to to add to the boycott i mean and when you think about what what they're sort of hinting at here is that if you can get more more people to join that are just quote unquote the regular fan um then the numbers of people in the boycott would obviously go up um and you know it's it, it, they i think they're really shooting for an inclusiveness um on this now um whether that's a response to losing one of the larger sections of the supporters groups with acb going back into the stadium i mean remains to be seen uh but i, I think that there are probably a lot of not casuals because i think as a casual fan you probably no, there's a boycott going on, but don't think it's about you at all. Um, or uh, if you're if you're more of a diehard fan, but not part of a supporters group, then you know what's going on. I think that's what this is. Um, and I, I really think that there is an effort to create a fan council. Um, and that's not just inclusive of the supporters groups, um, but uh, with the the uh, hardcore fans that are also not in um, in those supporter groups as well. Right. So. Uh, fan, a fan can, council is super interesting, um, and we all know about Seattle and how they have basically the the fans have part of the fan council has a vote on retaining the general manager um, and whether or not he stays or goes, and they actually have a vote in that. It doesn't mean they can decide things, but if they vote with other people and they have the ability to, um, they can band together with other votes to create change and impact change. So super interesting. Um, I wonder if Uncle Phil would even uh, entertain something like that. But uh, the splintering of the groups and certainly all of the the bad blood that's been on social media this last week and the week before, um, you know, a, a little shout for, I think, calmer heads would help everybody. And as a uh, as an observer of all of this, um, I'm interested to see how it all plays out in the game uh, whenever the Galaxy take on Colorado. So uh, that's sort of uh, some interesting stuff to sort of talk about a little bit. And we'll have more updates. And whenever I go to the game on Saturday night, be able to tell you a little bit more about how all of this. All right. All right. Um, one of the the LA Galaxy held their their press conference this morning. Um, I shouldn't say this morning, but um, today. Uh, it was better because it was usually right around 12, 1230, that type of thing. Whenever the guys are done for training, uh, a little rain in the area, no problem. Um, I did see somebody say that there was like almost a tornado uh, near near Carson somewhere, which, you know, who uh, I think somebody joked that it was Douglas Costa heading to another concert um, because he got uh, injured. And we're going to talk about that in a second, but that's probably not true either. Um, it, it's we're going to talk about Douglas Costa and the injury and basically uh, a soleus injury injury. So a calf injury. Um, and this is something that's been bothering and plaguing him. And apparently it happened uh, one of the first plays in the game. 
against Orlando and then was one of the reasons for the sub and also a change into a different formation. Um, Greg certainly indicated in his post game, if you listen to that, that uh, part of the reason for the changes was to sit themselves into more of a, you know, dedicated 3 5 2 and not a modified one like they were sort of had a 4 4 2 uh, modified in the first half. And so, um, that's interesting now to find out that there was an injury there because there was no talk of an injury on the night. How saying and, and I think everybody assumed, myself included, that because of Douglas Picasso's poor play in that first half, that that's why he got subbed. Maybe Greg's backtracking a little bit on it, um, or maybe that was always the intention and nobody asked the question. I wasn't on the call on uh, uh, after the Orlando game, so uh, partially my fault. Um, but now with Douglas Costa out, possibly three to four weeks, um, you know, you're looking at a, another problem. Um, and, and, you know, this is a problem. Here's the big deal is the first call I called somebody, I said, Hey, Douglas Costa got hurt again. They're like, of course he did. And we're at that point with Douglas Costa, right? Uh, he sort of baited the fans with like, Oh, I love the hate and I'm going to show you, you know, that you're wrong. And then showed us, showed everybody nothing. Um, and he's sort of been this guy who still has these moments of bravado that, that can't be backed up. Um, maybe it's the old guy at the bar who wants to pick fights because he used to fight whenever he was, you know, 20 years old and now he's uh, 60 years old and he still wants to pick fights. Um, it, it sort of feels a little bit like that. Like these are all empty, hollow things. Having said that, um, you know, being injury prone and all these other things that, that sort of happened to him. Um, you know, I, I think there certainly is a question about what he's doing really to make sure his body is constantly ready. Now, Vanny, said you know he's cut down and he's trimmed down and he looks good and he's been pressing hard in training and he really wanted to come out and show, sort of show what he could do i get that um but uh it's mr sasha question who says availability is your greater greatest ability right being available um and as you get older and if you ask any veteran mls player who played at any sort of level towards the end of their career they'll tell you how much harder it is to train to prepare and to be ready and get your body ready for every single game um, so when we look at that, is Douglas Costa doing everything he can? Some people are injury prone. They absolutely are. But there's also a, there's a, there's a theory or, or a school of thought that says that you can help to prevent a lot of the injuries you do by how you prepare for games. Um, and if Douglas Costa keeps having the same problem with his calf, like it could come down to be as simple as that. You need to stretch. You need to stretch three or four or five times a day. You need to have a you know, physical trainer, a personal trainer come in and stretch you, um, you know, three times a day. You need to get rub downs and massages and all those things to break up scar tissue. And, you know, you have to eat the right things. And you have to be on the diet that that is best for these problems. And it's hard for me to say that Douglas Costa is always the one who is committed to doing those things. Uh, certainly whenever you see his play on the field and certainly whenever you see the results that have come from his play on the field. You know, Hammer and I uh, famously, we were going to recreate our, our argument for, you know, is he capable? It, it, it's a mental thing for me. Um, and, and maybe his body isn't physically capable, but the mental capability of being able to prepare for yourself day in, day out is important. And I think that he's missing that. Uh, this is, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Let's go, let's go total theory. Total theory. I have nothing to back this up. Let's just pretend that what I'm saying is true. The way that Douglas Costa was shopping around for teams in the preseason and the Galaxy, and I specifically asked Greg Vanny, did you know that he was out there and did he do it with the team's approval? And the answer was, yes, we knew. And yes, it was with our approval. So the Galaxy knew that he possibly might not come back because he was looking for somewhere else to go. Now, when that didn't happen, it feels like Vanny was ready to buy him out felt like AEG was ready to buy him out in fact all of the knowledge across most of major league soccer expected that Douglas Costa was going to get bought out and then something shifted and changed to where all of a sudden it was like Greg Vanny's like oh no he's committed he's ready to go he's coming in but the whole deal and to me that feels like AEG said no more buyouts no more buyouts Chris Klein no more buyouts Greg Vanny Greg Vanny we haven't bought out a lot of players but we're not going to buy out this guy because Chris Klein has bought out a whole bunch of players before um, and we spent a lot of money on bad contracts. And you guys are just going to have to deal and lie in the bed that you made with Douglas Costa. You wanted them for two years. You signed them for two years. You're giving them $5 million. All of those things are happening. And you now have to deal with those consequences. And Chris, if you want to stick around and make the playoffs, then you make the playoffs with Douglas Costa. 
Okay. And so that's what it feels like happened. Again, no knowledge of that is true, right? But it's a good story that you can certainly connect the dots to because things change and all of a sudden, oh no, Douglas is committed and Douglas wants to be here. And it's like, it almost sounded like you didn't have any other options. Like there was no ability to buy out Douglas Costa and that nobody wanted him. All right. So that's the mindset I sort of feel that, uh, and, and if we want to play, you know, fantasy, then I'm telling you that's the fantasy that I, I, I have about that situation is that it is, it was AEG said no more, no more money. You're not allowed to buy people out of bad contracts. You made the contracts live with them, you know, no more parking Jorgen Shelvick, wherever you parked him. You know, no more parking people Gonzalez wherever you parked him. No more buying out Giovanni Dos Santos. No more, you know, hanging on to Jonathan Dos Santos for years. Uh, you guys are done. You've been cut off. Uncle Phil says no more, right? Maybe that's the case. Maybe this is the way that Chris Klein has to prove that he is willing to stay is to abide and compete by the con by the uh, by the roster that he put together. All right. So. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, and so, by the way, uh, uh, Bam Dad says he just didn't want to get boob, booed on Saturday. I, I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, that's also part of the thing. You know that that was going to happen after the problems that he had in Orlando. And listen, Greg Vanny went on pretty long to talk about Orlando and stuff. I thought it was really interesting stuff. Uh, let's get to the Greg Vanny uh, press conference a little bit. Uh, I think Damian Calhoun was there. I think Scott French was there. Um, there might've been one or two other people there. Um, but, uh, let's get some updates and, uh, and go over some of this stuff. And while Greg Vanny talks, then I don't have to for a little bit. So let's get to, uh, Greg Vanny talking about Jonathan bond. Damian said, uh, basically, you know, Jonathan says he's been healing up. So is, is he in the mix for this week? And this is what Greg Vanny had to say. Yeah, he's, uh, I mean, he's been training. He's, been pretty close to the full training this week so tomorrow he'll get into probably more of the training see how he feels before we game time decision where whether he's in the mix or not in the mix so uh i'm guessing he probably would like to get a full week of like just real live training just to be certain and confident about certain things but we'll see where he is tomorrow and how he's feeling so i think he's just in that space where there's scar tissue in there that is you know at times breaks up and gets sore and things like that so hopefully hopefully we can work him through that Tomorrow or through the next few days. You're in a three games in a what, seven eight stretch. Yeah, we're at, we're eight and twenty potentially eight and twenty six. Yeah. yeah, so it, this next week it's a game every four days, and then after that it's every three days. So it's uh, it gets busy for us. All right, there it goes. Just talking about Jonathan Bond coming back. Probably not in the mix this weekend. That's what they're saying. But Jonathan Bond possibly coming back the next weekend uh, after the full week of training. And Vanny saying he's going to be a little bit more. The the follow up there is you're in three games in the next seven days. Damian Calhoun said, and Greg said, yeah, we're we're eight uh, in the next twenty six. Uh, and so he says um, that's a game every four days for the next w- next week. And then it's after that, it's every three days. So you know it's going to get busy for us. It, it's interesting because they go on and talk about how this might be good for the galaxy. It's like yeah, and Greg basically acknowledges that it's good for it. Um, basically saying we get three home games in a row right now, right? You're going to get Colorado. Uh, you're going to get the Seattle open cup game. Um, and then let's get our little schedule up here while I talk about that. Cause that's always more fun. Uh, and then you get San Jose at home as well before going off to Columbus DC on that road trip and then home to Charlotte again. And then away to real salt Lake. If the galaxy were to make any moves, get any momentum going, may is a good one to do it. Just difficult, right? Colorado is not an easy team to beat. They are, they are underperforming just like the LA galaxy are. Um, I'll tell you a story about that whenever we get to start talking about them. Um, but then the LA Galaxy hosts Seattle in the Open Cup, and the Open Cup is very important to Seattle, always has been, so we'll see what lineups end up coming out. But if you're the Galaxy, it's probably a first-team lineup uh, with some sh- really small, short rotations. And then the Galaxy have a rivalry game against San Jose coming up on uh, May 14th. So that those are back-to-back-to-back pretty quick. And then one game every three days, quick, quick, quick. Columbus, D.C., that's a midweek game. Um, and then uh, you go to uh, the, excuse me, Columbus, um, and which is the midweek game, and then D.C. on the weekend, and then home for Charlotte uh, again. So a lot of games coming up, and if you look at it through the end of June as well, you got these other ones, St. Louis on uh, 6-11. There's a little break. I think it's an international break. Uh, and then L.A. Um, hosts Kansas City, the worst team in Major League Soccer right now. Uh, Galaxy just bare 
slightly above them, and then Colorado as well. So um, that was some of the stuff from from Greg Vanny's um, uh, press conference. He did say, like I said, he thought it would be good and start getting some momentum and, and doing some stuff. Um, I did want to get to Greg talking a little bit about what happened in Orlando. So I always like to hear what happens after the, the uh, after the game. But then I also want to hear the progression of what has been fixed, right? So, hey, Greg, tell us now what you really think after watching film and everything else. And uh, Scott French was asking about missing Ricky Pouge. Uh, and here is what Greg Vanny had to say. Yeah, I mean, a part of it is, as I said to the guys, you know, it took us 43 minutes to actually find, like, the structure that we wanted to play out of. Uh, and for too much of the game, partly because early on we turned over balls that we shouldn't, and it didn't allow us to get time on the ball to establish our positional play and the structure that we wanted to be in that would ensure us possession. Uh, and because of those turnovers and then us not getting into uh, our overloads and the shapes, it just became a game with a lot of turnovers, transitions. It's expensive defensively. And if you're in Florida and you're, you're re- having to defend in long stretches, it just becomes expensive physically. And so... Um, yeah, that was a problem. Second half got a little bit better in terms of that side of things. Um, but for sure, as Ricky is in there, then it ensures some mobility. It ensures some overloads in certain areas. It definitely gives us, he can wiggle out of pressure sometimes in games when teams are high pressing. He can do a little bit something different. Uh, and this game, you know, adapting the way we did didn't give us the solutions that we wanted to off the bat. And that became a, that became a struggle through the first part of the game. Is he pre- so uh, there he goes, Vanny talking about you know the struggles. He also talks about how expensive it was defensively and expensive in terms of the subs they had to make with Aude and and um, and Jalen Neal cramping up in the game, uh, hot, humid in Florida, trying to run too much, not having possession, having to chase, and how that's expensive defensively. I like that that term, expensive defensively. Um, but it's just um, you know. It, I think, and I, I said this on Monday, is that they really use Ricky Pooch as this relief valve, and when he's not there, you could see how quickly they got into um, into trouble. Now let's get to Douglas Costa and his injury. Uh, we'll get you what Greg said about how he got hurt, um, and then Scott French pressing on exactly what the injury is, and then we can uh, we can talk about that. So here's Greg answering about uh, Douglas. He, he did. He first first play of the game, free kick, I think, or second play. He injured a calf, so he tried. He wasn't sure. Uh, he said while he was warm, he wasn't totally sure if what he felt was what he thought he felt. So he tried to keep going through the half. But as the half started to wear down, as he started to fatigue, and certainly when he got to halftime and cooled off, he realized that what he hoped didn't happen happened. So. Uh, yeah, so that became problematic for us pretty early in the game as well because I think he was kind of feeling things out too to see where he was. So, um, but yeah, so he'll be uh, he'll be on a you know, recovery and return to play, and then it'll, it won't be super short. So we'll see. But do you have a feel for the timeline? Yeah, uh, it's a, again, it's a soleus, so these mm-hmm. are tricky. So it's you know, so. yeah, four weeks usually is kind of the baseline for something like that. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, yeah, I mean it's it's tough. It's a tough one, you know. He, to, in fairness to him, he's been working hard and doing all the things. We got there; it rained pretty heavy the night before, so the field was pretty soft. And I don't know. Sometimes you go from being hard fields to soft fields, travel these kinds of things, and you're a little bit vulnerable if you already have some vulnerabilities. I don't know. So it's unfortunate because it just again it's another another setback and both for him, for the group, and I know you know when he came on the last couple games, he's. He really wants to try to prove that he's, you know, going to help his team and and be that be the guy or be a guy inside of our group. And it's now it's just another setback. It's frustrating for for him. All right, there you go. A little Douglas Costa. So about four weeks, three to four weeks, uh, seems about right. Maybe even a little bit longer. It's a soleus. Guess what? Mavinga also has a soleus injury. Um, he's a week to two weeks out. Uh, one week basically should start training and running on the field next week and then possibly be getting into training the week after that. Now, there was a question uh, asked about uh, Greg Vanny and about the guys going to U22s, right? And where all that goes. Um, we go to uh, Michele uh, Gion- Giannoni. I always say it wrong. That's okay. Uh, Greg Vanny uh, mentions that if selected, Marcus Fercranis and Mauricio Cuevas will be released for the U20 World Cup with Jalen Neal, different situation because of his importance in the team. They're working with U.S. soccer to find the best solution for team and player. Maybe he could go a little bit later, those types of things. But it, it's it's what I have told you is that Cuevas and Fercranis um, are, 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 can be released. Uh, Aude, 
Uh, specifically, Aude was not listed on the Argentina U-20 roster, and it seems that Greg Vanny, uh, the Argentine uh, national team, um, and the player are all on the same page on that, basically saying, and Tom Boger confirmed this, LA Galaxy left back uh, Julian Aude was not on Argentina's squad for the U-20 World Cup. Uh, he said he smoked with Greg Vanny about this. Essentially, all parties, club player, players camp, national team, agreed it would be more beneficial for them to stay at LA Galaxy and keep playing a key role. Listen, um, U-20 World Cup's really cool, and for, for Aude, I feel a little bit for him because it's in his home country. Um, but I'm not one of these people who's like, oh, well, they have to go because it's such a great experience. It's, a, it's an interesting experience for sure. It's not the biggest game in town, and I would imagine that the level that you're going to get in Major League Soccer is going to be better. So if you're a starter and you're getting serious time uh, and you're working on developing as a player, I think both for Jalen Neal and uh, and Aude, they're, they're thinking they should be on the national team, right? Not the U-20 national team. Uh, there's also, I think, a U-23 World Cup perhaps next year um, that those guys could play a part and a role in as well. Uh, Jalen may still play a part in a role, um, but everybody's sitting there going, well, the Galaxy suck. They should leave anyway. The Galaxy are going to do everything they can and rightfully so to right the ship and get onto a, a good standing heading back towards the playoffs. Uh, is it possible? Absolutely possible. Um, the team is underperforming where they should be. Now, should they be? Are they a top nine team in the Western Conference? I think they are, but they certainly haven't shown it and they're going to need to find a string of games. Maybe with Douglas Costa out for this amount of time, for these amount of games, whenever you look at all the games that are possibly happening in the next month. Um, maybe this allows the LA Galaxy to settle into a rhythm that they haven't had before. Maybe uh, with Aude coming in, uh, with Caligari really settling in, with Jalen Neal back there, with Kosaris in there, um, you know, you should have Brugman and Puj as long as he doesn't get yellow cards like crazy. You have Chicharito who's healthy, you have Jovalich and Chicharito who seem to be finding each other and really playing a lot better with each other this year. Um, and, and, uh, if, uh, Jovalich was one of those guys who was talking today as well and saying that he really thought that the combination was get there and it'll be better against Colorado and all these other things. So there's a lot of positivity in that. I know it was an open training as well. Uh, I think Alex, who's in our discord, one of the mods in our discord was at the open training, basically said that it's a tight knit group of guys. They really enjoy being around each other. It's fun to watch them train those types of things. Uh, pretty light training as you would imagine. It's probably going to be another light day as they get into uh, Friday um, and then a game on Saturday. So really uh, a lot of stuff um, sort of uh, com coming together to understand the workload that all the legs are going to start taking. Um, I'm going to cruise through some of this other stuff and see if there's anything else that I wanted to talk about. Um, let's get Greg Vanny's thoughts on Colorado as we're getting ready for that Colorado preview. So here's Greg talking about uh, Robin Frazier's good friend and Colorado. Yeah, they're... They're uh, a tough team, you know. Obviously, Robin uh, know him well and his competitiveness and, and what he's expecting from his group. Uh, but they're athletic. They're, they're, they're big. Um, they're direct. You know, they're going to look to play behind us. They're going to look to try to exploit uh, spaces behind our back line for sure. Uh, it'll be, you know, always with them is sometimes he'll come out and he'll be pretty active in the press and sometimes he'll sit and play you really on the counter. He's got, you know, Robin's got some different weapons in terms of the guys up top between Barrios and Cabral and Lewis and these guys are flyers that, that uh, can get you in counterattacks and uh, or he can choose to be aggressive and press so um, you know they're a team that hasn't got a lot of, of results but they probably deserve more results than they've gotten I think they're I saw something that came out yesterday that they're uh, nine goals below their expected goals which is you know maybe one of the top in the league so sometimes you think that they're underperforming on that side of things a little bit which is something you just got to be can't take for granted that they can be a dangerous team and you got to make sure that we we defend well and control uh control the things we can control and try to keep the ball uh and when we do have the ball we need to be also very aware of the transition moments i mean it's a this is a formula i say to you guys i feel like about every time we play and play at home that We've got to be able to be responsible with the ball. We've got to create and finish chances. And we've got to keep a game at zero and give ourselves a chance to get on the front side of it. And uh, and then from there, we can <clears throat> we can play from a positive position instead of a chasing position. Loudest bird ever. Actually, if you listen to the whole press conference, and I'll try to get the video uploaded tomorrow, so that way you can listen to the whole thing. Um, if you listen to that press conference, it's like trucks driving by and then the loudest bird ever. Um 
so it, it's there was a lot of things going on, and even Greg paused once whenever one of the trucks was going through. So uh, the final thing was on Mavinga, and I think we already updated on uh, on that. There is an interesting talk about total football and spaces and marking and where Greg Vanny's train of thought or school of, school of thought comes from on how things go together. Uh, and Pep and Pep Guardiola and, and a whole bunch of stuff that's interesting. Uh, I would implore you to find it and listen to it because I, I find it uh, entertaining um, just to hear where all that stuff comes from. So um, that's the thing that uh, that's the the press conference and the majority of it. I thought jo- uh, Jovalich was really interesting too. He was short. He was brief as you would expect him to be. He usually is. Um, but he was just, he was very positive, very gung ho. He was like, we're going to get better. We know we can play better. We're going to get better. And that seems to be, it seems to be a, a you know a little bit of a rallying cry again for the teams, and you can argue that it doesn't mean anything. I always think it does. Um, whenever you hear how unified a lot of the guys uh, usually are with how what they say and how they do it, and I think Greg Vanny is is more dedicated to going to a two man set. So uh, again, against Colorado, I wouldn't be surprised Chicharito and Jovalich start in that area. So we'll uh, we'll certainly look at that and and get you ready for that one. Um, Talked about Wrexham. I got that. Uh, the uh, the U.S. Open Cup game uh, against the Seattle Sounders. I just wanted to give you a heads up. Uh, they did find TV coverage for this. So fans can watch all the open coverage on CBS Sports Golozo Network, uh, which is available to stream free on connected TV and mobile devices through the CBS Sports app and Pluto TV and on CBSSports.com as well as on Paramount+. Plus. Uh, I don't think it's on Spectrum, somebody said. Uh, so you're going to have to go out and actually uh, actually find that one. So that's something there um, that you're going to want to pay attention to. Uh, the last thing I wanted to get to before we get to the game preview is analytics. Analytics is fun. Uh, let's see. I want to go to my article, and I want to click on that button. There we go. American Soccer uh, Analysis put out their 2023 MLS Analytics sur- Survey. Um, every year, we update the state of MLS analytics by putting teams into tiers based upon how many analytics staff they have. Uh, this one done by Elliot McKinley, uh, and this was the May 2nd version at uh, it's, uh, you can find it at American soccer analysis.com. Always interesting. I think it's always fun to read their stuff. Um, so one of the first two questions they asked, what are the five most analytically advanced MLS teams and what are the five least analytically advanced MLS teams? Let's bring up that chart. All right. All the good teams over here. Seattle Sounders are one of the most as people say, and their perception is Seattle Sounders are one of the most advanced analytically, uh, Toronto, New York, Red Bulls enter Miami. They make an interesting note about in Miami. Uh, there's a one guy who is in there doing the analytics stuff, but they like him and how he does things so well that they actually have a pretty interesting, um, you know, sort of uh, um, take on on how he's able to to affect the team with analytics. Uh, San Jose Earthquakes, Nashville, Los Angeles FC, uh, Philadelphia Union, Atlanta United, Colorado Rapids, New York City, Austin FC, Orlando City. Let me know when I get to the to the LA Galaxy. Orlando City, Vancouver Whitecaps, Columbus Crew, Houston Dynamo, Chicago Fire, still not there. FC Cincinnati, New England Revolution, DC United. Saint, by the way, we're getting into like the, the least advanced uh, people on how many votes they got for least advanced. Uh, Houston Dynamo, Chicago Fire, FC Cincinnati, New England Revolution, DC United, St. Louis City, uh, Real Salt Lake, LA Galaxy got five votes as the least advanced in, in terms of analytics um, in the thing, in the entire league. This is a survey, so it's a perception base. It's not factual. And some people even said it's it, that it's very often that teams don't want to even talk about analytics because they don't want to give away the secrets that they're doing. Now, um, the LA Galaxy being at the bottom of the list is probably not surprising. We've been talking about it since 2017, and since coaches have been fired and said that they need an analytics department and nothing has been done. Uh, we talked about it after Anolfo left. We talked about it after Siggy Schmidt left. We talked about it after Gamera Bershkolota left. Uh, And now we're talking about it here with Greg Vanny as well. Now, by my understanding, and I don't know if this has changed, so this is my understanding as of the situation right now, is the LA Galaxy do have some consultants that are pulling analytics. Now, whether or not those are in-game analytics or whether that was the ability to scout through analytics and evaluate players through analytics, that's a good question. I do believe they're able to do both right now. Uh, But they're more consultants and not full-time employees of the club. That's my understanding. Could be wrong. Um, And some people wear multiple hats whenever they do this as well. So it's not always easy to define them exactly. Has it gotten better? I think it has. Um, But as you can see, the perception around the league um, is that the LA Galaxy are one of the least advanced in analytics in 
Major League Soccer and how that is possible for a team that spends as much money as they do, um, but also relied on a referral scouting system for as long as they did. Uh, if we go to another chart, the most analytically influenced MLS teams. So these are the teams they think are the most influenced by analytics. The analytics play the biggest part in these teams. Seattle Sounders, Nashville, Philadelphia, New York, Vancouver, Atlanta, Inter Miami, Orlando, and San Jose. San Jose is starting to see some, some turnaround with their analytics department. It usually takes a couple years in order for that to happen. Michael Stevens coming on, the ability to put in ghost teams. We've talked about that before, but you're talking about an investment in years and not months and not quick turnarounds and all those things. Um, so I want to do, uh, to touch on that, um, I'm, I'm looking at sort of, you know, uh, what team most incorporates analytics into their decision making. That's that list that I just gave you. Um, I thought this one was interesting. What position... Um, and we'll do that. Uh, what position is the easiest to evaluate, evaluate quantitatively? And it's striker. Um, they say with the goals and the finishing and all the things that you sort of have. So a striker, 10 votes for that. Central attacking midfielders, as I said, was easiest. Goalkeeper won. Uh, they said what position is the hardest to evaluate? And it's a center back, duh. Um, that's why, that's why people miss on center backs. The best center backs don't necessarily make tackles. Uh, I was talking to a former center back once and he was like, you know, whenever you have to slide tackle somebody, you made a mistake. You're now an emergency defending and emergency defending means that you didn't put yourself in the right position to be able to defend. And he goes, and most center backs are just the quiet guys. Um, they asked, does your team use analytics for in-game decision-making? Uh, 10 said yes. Uh, five said no, one abstained. Uh, what programming language tools do you primarily lose? I think it's interesting to use Python and R in terms of the coding and uh, the ability to to code for analytics and write different data sets and Excel, the data brick, all that other stuff. So I think that's interesting. I think they use everything, by the way, too. Um, they said, how do you think MLS compares to in its use of analytics to other soccer leagues around the world? Um, the general consensus among analytics staff is that MLS as a whole is probably among the world leaders in acceptance of analytics. However, the best in Europe think Liverpool, Barcelona will beat the best MLS analytics departments. Um, then they went and they said, how do you think MLS compares in its use of analytics to other North American major sports leagues? And somebody was quoted as saying way, way behind baseball and basketball, probably equal to hockey, but probably the worst in the major five leagues. Um, I like how they put themselves in that, which I think they should. I just like how they do it. Um, so that's the analytics sort of report that I just wanted to touch on. Again, really read it in depth. I think it's really interesting. I think you'll find it interesting if you like analytics and you want to know sort of about the league and how it goes. Go to American Soccer Analysis and then obviously look up Elliot McKinley and this 2023 MLS analytics survey. All right, good. Glad we could talk. Um Let's get to some standings real quick, um, just so that way we can push through those. Eastern standings, Bruce Arena in New England, uh, 21 points over there. Uh, the Western Conference, it's Seattle leading with 20 points. Uh, the LA Galaxy sitting in 13th, again, just three points from the bottom, uh, with Sporting Kansas City sitting right below them. Um, you're looking at Supporter Shield. Uh, it's New England Revolution leading Supporter Shield. FC Cincinnati tied with them. Uh, Seattle in third, St. Louis in fourth, LAFC in fifth, Atlanta in sixth, seventh is Nashville, eighth is Dallas, ninth is New York City, tenth is San Jose, eleventh is Columbus, twelfth is DC. Uh, we've already talked about a lot of the schedule coming up for the LA Galaxy, so we won't dive back into that. But here are the games coming up. Charlotte hosting New York City, uh, Cincinnati hosting D.C., Miami hosting Atlanta, Montreal hosting Orlando. It's Philadelphia away to Red Bull, New York, uh, LAFC at San Jose, uh, Toronto hosting New England, Dallas hosting St. Louis. Houston hosting RSL, Nashville hosting Chicago, LA hosting Colorado. We'll talk about that next. Portland hosting at uh, Austin, excuse me, uh, and Vancouver hosting Minnesota. Uh, uh, by the way, shout out to Alex, uh, who I was talking about earlier. And by the way, Alex is in the chat room, so I appreciate that. Uh, $50 super chat. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I really appreciate it. Uh, just a reminder for everybody to love everybody. Also, a special thank you to the guy who has a real job, but has put together a platform that informs and allows us to connect with our community. Be respectful of all, especially our COG leader. Oh, I'm sure people will think I'm full of crap all the time, Alex. That's fine. Um, there's currently 166 of you. There's probably 150 of you who think I'm full of crap. Um, but I appreciate that, Alex. You are most welcome, and we're glad to have you on the COG Discord, and you provide a good, positive vibe. In fact, we've created a good vibes-only channel, which is... Is it's almost a challenge to go in there and try to say something positive about the LA Galaxy. I enjoy doing it on a regular basis. So thank you to that, Alex. Appreciate it. Let's get you ready for this game coming up. The LA Galaxy uh, versus uh, Colorado Rapids. I do not have a friendly game preview for you. 
um, but I will be happy to, to put on the dramatic music um, so that way we can pretend that we have something. It is May the 4th. Be with you. It's Star Wars night. That's right. On May 6th. Here are the details we have for uh, the May 6th game coming up at 7.30 TV time, 7.39 kickoff time, LA Galaxy in Colorado. Uh, Soccer Fest is going to be there. Uh, they're going to have, uh, let's see, the Soccer Fest will also have Luke's lightsaber displayed. We'll showcase a variety of different lightsabers, face painters, Star Wars themed photo backdrop. The Boys and Girls Club of Carson will be the LA Galaxy Foundation community part of the match. Fans can visit their booth at Soccer Fest to learn more about programming. Um, Southern California artist and photographer Isaiah, uh, Isaiah uh, Takahashi um, will be in the Soccer Fest displaying art and a limited edition LA Galaxy poster giveaway at his booth. Uh, game presentation presented by Dignity Health on this particular one. Uh, the LA Galaxy Foundation is going to have an auction of a day on Jovovich Star Wars bobblehead signed by the Serbian International Forward himself. So it's that Boba Fett uh, day on Jovovich. Uh, um, bobblehead. Uh, they have merchandise. The Galaxy will debut a black on black hat available to fans to purchase on Star Wars night. Um, the new originals hat line will feature a snapback and fitted hat. Let's see. Extra time. All fans are welcome to stop by extra time. The LA Galaxy's post-match party with uh, Mosh Isley, a Star Wars themed and dance fueled punk super party providing music following the game. Uh, that's, I believe, up in the American Express Club. Um, so that's what you have. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff going on for all of those. Uh, but really, it's about the LA Galaxy, a team that has uh, struggled to find wins against a team in Colorado who has struggled to find wins as well. In fact, the uh, just just slightly ahead of the LA Galaxy in terms of points um, and in terms of goals and everything else. I was, I was going to point out this wonderful chart, and I thought it was hysterical. Uh, I found this chart, and I'm like, wow, Colorado. Look at all the... This is their total list of goal scorers for Colorado. Berrios, Max, Bassett, Cabral, and Rubio. And the top guy has two goals. Well, if you go to the LA Galaxy's list, everybody only has one. So there's really not much to, to sort of disc, try to try to not compare there. Uh, when we look at some match facts, the Galaxy beat the Rapids in the most recent matchup in September. Last season, a 4-1, the most goals scored by LA in the fixture since a 6-0 result in September 2014. However, that was the Rapids' first loss to LA since 2018, going unbeaten in the eight prior matches against the Galaxy, winning six and drawing two. Um... Colorado drew with Vancouver on Saturday, 0-0. The Rapids' third goalless draw already this season. The Galaxy have two, by the way, um, after playing two goalless draws through the entirety of last year. Uh, this time, Colorado had more goalless draws in a single season. was in 2016, a season where the Rapids conceded the fewest goals in Major League Soccer. Uh, finally, the Galaxy have compiled 13.3 expected goals to their first nine games, but have scored just seven times, underperforming their XG by 6.3. The only team underperforming their XG this season, by a bigger margin, are the Colorado Rapids underperforming by a mark of 8.9, uh, 14.9 XG um, with six goals scored. Um, Diego Rubio missed a penalty in the 80th minute against Vancouver Saturday, his third miss in seven regular season penalty attempts since 2017. In that time, only Sebastian Giovinco has missed more penalties while attempting seven or fewer. Um, miss five of the seven. That's that's one of those things that like, hey, if Rubio comes up and it's all on his head, that might be a, a good sign. Uh, the LA Galaxy and Colorado are facing themselves for this is a rec 45 wins for the LA Galaxy, 12 draws in this and 33 wins for Colorado. Those are a tremendous amount, two original teams um, and they still go out and of course the last game 4-1. Colorado had beaten the LA Galaxy in Colorado 2-0 in 2022. Um, and then we look back at 2021. Uh, the last time they were at Colorado was a 1-1 draw. Uh, I, I love the stats. Colorado is going to give the ball to the LA Galaxy. Uh, I watched some of that game against Vancouver, which I would not suggest anybody do. Um, and Colorado was simply sitting in the stay back, block shots, block lanes, make things crowded, stay compact. Um, and fend off and look for the counterattack. And you know Mr. Counterattack is there too, uh, Mr. Kevin Cabral. The LA Galaxy paying 50% of Cabral's salary, um, but he'll be back in Los Angeles to play against them. He has one goal on the season, has not been starting, uh, but he did start in the in Colorado's Open Cup game. Uh, so they had an Open Cup game, and then they had a weekend game, um, and that's what sort of leads it. The, the Rapids were successful 3-1 to one in that particular game. Kevin Cabral did not score a goal in that game. Uh, and then it was the 0-0 draw, Colorado, uh, against the Vancouver Whitecaps, and you can sort of see the starting lineup there with Barrios and Rubio. Um, you know, some some guy Max back there as well. Wilson, uh, Yarbrough in the, in the goal. Um, so there's uh, Lawless, uh, uh, what is it, Abukar? I always say it wrong anyway. I'd have to look it up because it gets cut off on some of these things too. 
If we look at the stats for that game, again, 61% possession for Vancouver, 38% possession for um, the Colorado Rapids. So a team that is going to want to counter. Craig Vanny said it. I will, of course, reply with that is absolutely the case. The LA Galaxy will hold possession. They will be able to control things. Uh, looking at the shots, Colorado able to just get, what, two shots on target? Yeah, two shots on target to five for Vancouver. Um, but they were greatly overshot, um, outshot in this game. Going back and looking at Colorado's record, uh, lost four nothing to Seattle to start everything out in, in February. Uh, Colorado and Kansas City zero zero. That sounds familiar. Uh, San Jose won Colorado zero in San Jose. Colorado lost two to one in Minnesota in Colorado. Austin uh, they went to Austin drew that game one one zero zero with LAFC in Colorado. Uh, one nothing win for Colorado over Kansas City in Kansas City, um, and then two two game Colorado and Charlotte. 1-1 one, one game, Colorado hosting St. Louis, and the 0-0 draw coming back to all of that. All right. Um, I think we're sort of in the position now to uh, to get ready and look at the uh, the stats and everything. 538, um, who has now hit a lot of their stuff. I wonder if all of these, these things are going to die, and then what will we do without 538? Um, but looking at uh, at the, the, the list of teams in Major League Soccer and where they are, 538 basically has LAFC ranked as the best team in Major League Soccer. It's Seattle, Philadelphia, Atlanta, New York City, FC Cincinnati, FC Dallas, New England, Vancouver, New York Red Bulls, Columbus, and LA Galaxy um, there um, as, as it comes down the list. Looking at this game, Galaxy are heavily favored 57%. Um, favored to win over 20% for the LA uh, for Colorado to win a 24% chance with a draw. So the Rapids coming into town. Kevin Cabral coming into town. It's Star Wars night. I mean, what... <sighs> No Douglas Costa. How does everything line up without Douglas Costa? Um, probably the same way it lines up in a lot of uh, different ways. We're actually in the Discord. We're talking about moving Cuevas up into that that right like wing back role. Um, you know, in in those particular cases, I think you're going to have a pretty standard four man back. I wouldn't be surprised to see the four four two back into effect. Um, of course, that's not how you attack, um, and it, it's more or less how they defend. Um, Aude will come back and defend in that four. Uh, Caligari will go up. They'll seesaw back and forth. And, and everybody tries to make a big deal about, uh, you know, defenders coming around the outside. I will say that that's the modern game. Defenders coming on the outside, creating overloads in the space, uh, trying to create overloads against the back line for the LA Galaxy. So flooding numbers forward, looking at spaces. Greg Vanny's big about space and spacing and the ability to uh, to. What is it? Maneuver your opponent whenever your opponent has the ball into spaces where you have control of the field as well, right? Like giving them only options to go into the places that you have covered very well. Blocking lanes, spacing, and all those fun things that you see. And then a lot of it, and especially whenever the LA Galaxy start playing well, is in those triangles and the triangles that are sort of created whenever spacing is correct, right? Staying apart from each other but close enough. The this, this short, intricate passes, being able to play through the middle. The big deal here for the LA Galaxy is getting caught on the counterattack. I don't know if Robin Frazier sits there and goes, we're going to start Kevin Cabral because he's going to be all pumped up to play against the LA Galaxy because he wants revenge. Um, I don't know if that's that's the case. I do think that you could definitely see Kevin Cabral come in off the bench. But does he start him? He could. Absolutely could. Maybe he thinks he's going to fire him up. Um, I've seen that by coaches do it, right? And, and Cabral's right on the edge, you know, so... The problem is the Galaxy don't have the speed to really match Kevin Cabral. I'm not saying that you need to be concerned about him, but you need to be concerned about Colorado's speed. You needed to be concerned about the LA Galaxy speed whenever Cabral was on the LA Galaxy as well, whenever Grant Sir was on the LA Galaxy. Um, they don't have that as much now, and Tyler Boyd isn't as much of that person uh, as that person as stretching the back line as you want him to be. He can do it. Um, but it requires Ricky Pouge to really open up the field in order to get the ball out in transition to Tyler Boyd or to, um, you know, Caligari crashing up on the right-hand side. Um, so, uh, you know, Vanny was really critical, and I think we've heard him uh, of sort of about how the Galaxy weren't patient against Orlando and how they gave up the ball and they weren't able to control, and that meant that they, were, that they had to run too much. He called that expensive defensively. Again, I think that's the best sort of word to word uh, that like sticks in my head from from all the press conference they talked about the galaxy need to make that less less expensive defensively by controlling possession and moving Colorado around Colorado's not going to want to come out of their shape Robin Frazier is very good at it if they do they may high press I don't think the high press works that well against the LA Galaxy I think they're actually pretty good at breaking um, high presses especially with Pooh she's able to dribble through three or four guys um, and sort of open up that stuff so 
Um, that's those are those things that that I would be looking at. Um, you know, I think somebody who could have a big game for the LA Galaxy. One, Ricky Pouge coming back after the yellow card suspension. Um, two is Tyler Boyd on the outside and finding him as a relief valve. Uh, I think Jovalich and and Chicharito could also have some fun in this game. I think that Colorado is good at clogging lanes. I think that they're good at creating a stalemate on the defensive side and limiting shots and blocking those shots, blocking lanes towards the goal, all of those things. Um, but having said that, uh, I, I do expect the LA Galaxy to win this game. I, I think this is probably a 2-1 game. Now, it's probably 2 nothing going into like you know the final 30 minutes and Colorado's going to score and everything's going to get a little bit more squeaky bum. But I do think the LA Galaxy win this game. They are not as bad as they have been. Um, they're not as bad as they showed in, I think, Orlando. Um, certainly not as bad as they were in Houston, although now there's two examples in 10 games, basically, that you can put out that said you were a really bad team. Um, but we have talked about this many times. Is when you suck, every game is hard. And for the LA Galaxy, who have been sucking, um, this game is going to be hard. Colorado's always difficult. Robin Frazier has Vanny's number for the most part. Um, but I, I always like the matchup. Uh, it's not. I don't think it's going to be the prettiest soccer. Um, so if you're a neutral and you're like, I want to watch a good game, I don't think this is that game. I, I, I wouldn't suggest that this is that game. So that's what I got. Uh, scores in the chat room. Uh, a little bit, please. Uh, and we'll we'll finish off with that. Um, hope Eric feels better. Um, I'm sorry that he's not uh, feeling better. Um, so uh, maybe he'll be back next week and we can get him on and, and we can talk about all the, th- all the things that he was suffering through um, whenever you come into it. And remember, Galaxy have this game and then it's Seattle, right? So we're, it's a quick turnaround and everything else. Uh, $2 Super Chat from 502 Tamales. I like that. Uh, hoping Cabral scores. I never liked fans booing him. It'll be. I, I'm interesting to see Kevin Cabral. Is we, we talked about this. What what kind of reaction do you get from from Kevin Cabral when he comes? It's indifference. Is what the reaction should be. Um, it's indifference. Um, so that's one of those things. Uh, Blue Ninja says three one Galaxy. Uh, Chewy says three one. Um, all right, I like that. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll leave it at that. All right. Uh, the LA galaxy playing the Colorado Rapids one last time. Dignity Hill sports park, May 6th, Saturday, May 6th, 7 30 PM is your TV start time. Kickoff 7 39 PM MLS season pass on Apple TV behind the paywall on this particular one and no fan whining. Uh, he super says two, two, too many goals in that game. Neither of these teams can score. Um, it, it, I think one nothing might be a sad. It might be the answer. Maybe zero zero is the answer uh, with how these two teams sort of uh, go about it. But I, I do think the LA Galaxy can win this game. So give me one one nothing two one that type of thing. All right, all right. I think we're good. Uh, if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Gessman, J G U E S M A N, and of course at Galaxy Podcast. Head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com that I'm still trying to fix. Uh, YouTube Corner of the Galaxy, iTunes Corner of the Galaxy, Spotify Corner of the Galaxy, SoundCloud's Corner of the Galaxy. Really type in Corner of the Galaxy. You can find everything that you want. Um, I think Chris had a super chat last time that I missed. So, Chris, we appreciate you. Thank you for the super chat. Certainly appreciate it. I don't think I missed anybody's this time. I always try to get them. Um, but there's no list and they disappear eventually. All right. So that's what we have. Uh, uh, I hope everybody has a good weekend. If you're going out to the game, we will see you there. And if not, we won't. And I hope you're watching on TV and we'll be back on Monday to talk about it all. All right. For Eric, the Portuguese hammer Vieira, who's not feeling very well. I'm Josh Pato Gessman. You've been listening. You've been watching to our little corner of the galaxy. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the corner of the galaxy podcast on corner of the galaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at galaxy podcast. And be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.